Hi, I'm Marcel van Lohuizen. Today I'm talking about my experiences with large-scale configuration at Google and how unification can help solve many of the known issues we've encountered. So a bit about me. After finishing my PhD in parallel natural language parsing, I joined an NLP startup called YY. The things I learned there were quite influential for how I approach configuration later on at Google. So in Google, I started on the search quality team, which was responsible for search ranking. So due to some work I did there, I ended up uh, on the founding team of Borg. So as you may know, Borg inspired later the development of Kubernetes. So on the Borg team, I was responsible for the creation of uh, BCL and GCL configuration languages, and also Borg config, which is the orchestration tooling around Borg. So after a while, I ended up working on the Go team. Towards the end of my stay on the Go team, I started developing Q, which I'll cover later in this talk. So partly related to this work, I ended my Google career doing research on configuration-related outages. So I recently left Google to work on Q full-time. So a bit more on how Q came about. So Q is directly influenced by Lingo. Lingo I used at the previous company. And Lingo is a logic programming system based on graph unification of typed feature structures. It itself was designed as a reaction to Prolog to take a more declarative approach and address some of the challenges of engineering large-scale grammars. So the beauty of this declarative approach really also shaped my thinking for configuration-related projects I worked on at Google later on. So the first one of these was WQ servers. Uh, my first ranking experiments were rather resource hungry and I needed uh, beefier test machines. So we had a pool of about a thousand machines for batch processing sitting idle. There was no MapReduce yet. Uh, so I ended up developing a rapid prototyping system that could map the entire search engine to this pool of homogeneous machines. So this started looking a lot like Borg and Kubernetes. Um, and it was a lot easier to use than the existing test setup. And soon it was actually used by teams to do beta launches, which is a bit scary. So because of this work, I ended up on the founding team of Borg. So there was no doubt that we should continue this declarative approach for deployment. So this resulted in the development of BCL and later GCL, which is still by far the most used configuration language at Google. Now, I had the idea of using something like type feature structures for GCL, but due to various bad choices, however, we ended up breaking some of the key properties of graph unification early on. We'll get back to that later. So granted, we didn't really know whether cloud configuration would look at all like configuring a grammar, but by hindsight though, we can observe that large cloud configuration often shares a striking similarity, namely that there's lots of regularity and lots of irregular exceptions within that regularity. So after observing all the issues arising with GCL and realizing the similarity, I started thinking what would have happened if we had stuck with the type feature structure approach. So my conclusion was that this initial idea really would have prevented these issues. So this prompted me to work on Q, use graph unification and to learn from the lessons of GCL of what not to do. So what are the lessons learned from GCL? So it's good to take a step back. Why the DSL in the first place? So Mike Hadler wrote this fascinating blog about the evolution of configurations within organizations. So basically, configuration values start out being hard-coded in binaries. So this is inflexible. So at some point, they get pulled out and controlled with like a YAML file. So then this is rather inflexible. So people have these sort of tooling around it, like rules engines to, to manage these. So from experience, though, it's a good idea to have configura configuration managed by the same version control system as code. So because of this and various other limitations, one might get the idea to develop a DSL to address these issues. So initially, this often works well and people are really happy, happy, but then something starts to happen. So the DSLs tend to get more complex over time to handle more complex cases because also the configurations tend to get more complex. And at some point, it gets so complex that they kind of started looking like programming languages. And then people are thinking like, well, if it looks and behaves like a programming language anyway, why don't we just no use known programming languages uh, to solve the problem? So another trend that you will see is the trend towards no configuration. So to say, okay, it's better actually to get rid of configuration altogether because none of these solutions really work. So in general, it's a really good idea to get rid of configuration where you can. <laughs> 
But in general, this configuration just comes back then at a higher level or there's always some configuration left and the system gets more complex. Ultimately, you still have a lot of configuration to deal with. So you're then back to this configuration complexity clock. So the question is now, what's the best place to be? So I would say that nine o'clock is the best place to be. So a simple DSL, if you will. So at Google though, we see the sentiment of going back towards 12 o'clock. So where did GCL fail? So even before GCL, I would say we had enough practice to know what is a good set of requirements. So my hypothesis now that DSLs often fail here because they meet, fail to meet the requirements and address the actual needs of a configuration language. So the goal is now to find a DSL that does meet these requirements. So let's look at what went wrong with GCL. So the two most important initial requirements based on the experience with the babysitter, which was the production system used at Google before Borg, were don't do complex computation in configuration and do not use more than one layer of overrides. So the basic idea is that it should always be easy to see where configuration values are coming from. So why is this important? So take a look at this diagram. So the vertical axis indicates uh, how easy it is to write a language and the horizontal axis indicates how easy it is to read a certain language. Um, so for scripting, it's important to crank things out quickly. So you often focus on writability, keep it nice, short and compact. It's often written by a single person and hopefully things will either keep simple or the script will be thrown away pretty soon. So a programming language uh, you use more if you're working in a large team or if the project is more sizable and needs to last longer um, because one person needs to read what another person wrote. And so you really want to value maintainability and readability even at the expense of writability. So for configuration language, uh, these requirements are actually more strict than for programming languages. So often configurations are modified in situations uh, of distress, like for example, in case of an outage, but more importantly, um, they're often also then modified by people that did not write your original configuration. So where a development team can base the choice of a programming language on the team's skill, like which languages they know, this is often not true for configuration languages. So often these are first configured by the initial development team, but then later taken over by an SRE, for example. So you can see why it's important that it's easy to see where values are coming from. So now re regarding the no complex computation requirements. So while one false assumption we made is that this requirement is actually quite easy to handle. So if you need comp computation, just define some higher level configuration values, pass these to a binary and then expand them there into whatever complex uh, computation you need to do. So we as Google have control over all the binaries. What's the idea? So that should be doable. So in practice, uh, people still wanted to compute at the configuration layer. So the problem was is that the users of the binary are often not the people that maintain the binary. So there is some friction there. So there might also be a different release cadence or people might want to um, configure a service, for example. Uh, but GCL didn't allow it, uh, the computation. So it's somebody else's problem to deal with this, right? Well, not until we added Lambda. So users had this often a legitimate issue where they had, for example, repeated expressions like uh, regular expressions or some other expressions within a configuration file, um, which was cumbersome to repeat. So they wanted to have some kind of macro functionality. So for this, we introduced lambdas. So of course, uh, lambdas were way more powerful than, um, than just solving this particular case. And it allowed to break the no complex computation rule uh, quite easily. So people actually implemented the Turing machine in it, uh, sorting algorithms on top of this Turing machine, Mandelbrot generators and all that stuff. So an important lesson here is that um, always carefully consider the impact of a language feature on the overall ecosystem uh, when you intend to add it. Um, but worse, it also gave rise to a different pattern that's often considered to be an anti-pattern for configuration, namely parametrization. So while lambdas can be used to compute values, they can just as well be used to create objects or tuples, how they were called in GCL. So this allowed people to create parameterized objects or abstractions, if you will. 
Um, so abstractions can be quite useful. They can protect users uh, from abuse. They uh, can allow interfacing with different backends. Um, and they can make things more compact and high details, right? But ultimately, a configuration is often defined in terms of an API. And so sooner or later, users, users will want to uh, add other features of this API. So what you will see is that the number of parameters in this abstraction is being ever increasing to the point it's about just as complex as the API. So this is not a good situation to be in. So one other desired property added later by Rob Pike is that one should use composition instead of overrides. So due to some unfortunate choices and miscommunication, graph unification was already ruled out early and we were using these simple one layered uh, overrides. And because of this, uh, we could not find any really good way to do this composition uh, properly. So we had these overrides. Then also inheritance was a natural extension to these overrides. So when users needed more complex way of composing things or combining things, um, the pressure to start using inheritance was pretty high. So it was argued actually that inheritance is simpler as it is more familiar to programmers already. So this is actually misguided as we'll see later. So later we tried to add graph unification like composition to GCL through the plus operator. But by this time, the desirable mathematical properties were already broken. So by hindsight though, allowing inheritance gave rise to the largest source of complexity in configuration. In other words, it really makes it hard to see where our values are coming from. So other failures of GCL. So GCL also focused too much on the data templating and generation aspect and too little on validation. So for programming languages, you need types for type safety, but for configuration languages, you need something more fine grained like constraints. So GCL uh, supported constraints in the form of uh, assertions. Um, they allow for fine grained ch checks, but they're kind of clunky. They're compositional, but clunky. So, um, um, you know, they're not very easy to deal with. So also another disadvantage is that uh, GCL could not catch typos and fields, which is a common source for errors. Um, then also for template riser, writers, it was uh, too easy for users to override best practices. Um, I mean, there was a way to add uh, the final key keyword to basically um, prevent users from overriding certain things, but it was too easy to forget and also wasn't fine grained enough. So another issue was not allowing cycles. So for template writers, this can be a real nuisance also. So if you have two fields that can be expressed in terms of each other, now template writers had to guess which one a user will want to fill out first, but you could not do both, right? Um, so there also were some software engineering challenges related to cycles, where a cycle could be introduced across configurations managed by multiple teams, uh, where it then wasn't clear which team would be responsible for breaking that cycle. So this was maybe perhaps not so common, but it was a thing and a problem. So given all this, let's take a look at this other system, Lingo, on which Q is based, which did not seem to have these issues, even for very large configurations. Um, so for this, let's look at uh, unification in particular. So let's get a feel for the difference. So suppose we want to create a, a class cat, and we already have a class dog, right? So what we can do then with inheritance is say, okay, we'll create a cat by taking dog and we're making the nose uh, dry instead of wet and making the cat meow instead of bark. So with unification, which does not have overrides, you're actually forced to introduce a new class called mammals from which both cat and dog are derived. Now, any non-computer scientist would say that this left approach is insane, right? And most people uh, would think the right approach is more natural and the way to go. Now, obviously, you can take this uh, right-hand side approach and use that in inheritance as well, right? But in practice, uh, the left-hand approach is actually quite common in GCL. And what's behind that probably is that a taxonomy of configuration is often not as clear in people's head as the taxonomy for uh, mammals. So another way to say this um, is this is actually the reason why it's sometimes also harder to write Q or use unification versus inheritance because it forces you to think about the structure up front. 
So this is generally a good thing and really helps maintainability, um, you know, but it's an important thing to know. So more importantly though, the use of inheritance broke some important mathematical properties that are really useful in configuration. And once you break these properties, you cannot get them back. So the good properties of unifications uh, I was referring to are being associative, commutative, and idempotent. And really this is just a fancy way of saying order doesn't matter, right? So these are some great properties. So unlike inheritance, uh, configuration elements can be combined freely in any order and the result will be the same, right? So it's this property that really reduces complexity relative to using overrides. So it also fits in well with the cross-cutting nature of uh, configuration, as we'll see later, and it enables aspect-oriented programming. So another very cool, well-documented well side effect of using unification of type feature structures is that constraints are both generative, so they can use to derive values and can serve as validation at the same time. So this is really a profound feature uh, that you cannot get allowing overrides. So now let's see how all of this is used in Q. One very important property of Q is that types are values. So all, both types and values are placed in this partial order, uh, a lattice more specifically. Um, so it ends up being constraint based, it's aspect oriented, it's composable the way Rob Pike meant it to be. Um, and it also has default values to allow for this one level of overrides. So it's, it's a very different mechanism, but it serves that purpose. Now, you can think of Q as a typed uh, JSON spreadsheet where each cell in the tree can have values, derived values and constraints. So let's look at some examples. So um, Q is really just a uh, JSON superset. So on the right hand side, you see JSON and on the left hand side, you see the equivalent value of Q. Um, and you see that Q is really nothing more than syntactic sugar around JSON. But as said, uh, Q also support types. So on the right hand side, you see a Go type. And on the left hand side, you see the equivalent in Q. Now syntactically, you see there's actually no difference uh, between uh, the value you saw earlier and this type now equivalent in Q. So on the right hand side, the values are now just identifiers uh, referring to types. So really types are just values in Q. But also constraints are values in Q. So on the right hand side, again, we see some open API and on the left hand side, we see the equivalent in Q. So you can see that Q is a lot more compact. And this is really a consequence of unifying types, constraints and values into the single concept. And actually when I need to read open API or JSON schema, I often translate it to Q first, just because it's more readable. So here we see an example of ordering values, constraints, and types in a lattice. So going from less to more specific from top to bottom. So in the upper band, we see types as you're used to them from programming languages. So in the middle band, we see constraints like number ranges and regular expressions. And then in the lower band, we see concrete or ground values uh, as they're called in logic programming. Now, also, entire configurations can be partially ordered in a lattice and are partially ordered in a lattice. So here we see the earlier examples. So at the top, we have our municipality again. Then we add some constraints on that in the forms of large capital, uh, which is an instance of a municipality. And at the very bottom, we have, uh, you know, like a concrete value, which is in turn um, an instance of large capital. So you see, we go from more specific to less specific, uh, but we can never break the rules of the higher levels. So really you can see that Q not only handles values, but really the whole spectrum of configuration related aspects. So even though these are ordered from uh, more to less specific here, how these things combines in practice is actually pretty arbitrary. So if you look at policy, for instance, they can be used to um, further constrain types or to add best practices to existing APIs or to validate a value. And also because there's no clear separation or layering, it's really a big benefit if a single system like Qubit can handle all of these aspects simultaneously. So what do we mean with aspect orientation? 
So Q's aspect orientation can be explained by considering Q as being a generalization of JSON. And by that, I mean not just a syntax, but also uh, by its semantics. So consider this object. So any JSON file can really be represented as a sequence of path value pairs, where um, you have tuples of leaf values and the paths that lead to these leaf values. So in Q, you can actually represent this. And what you see here is legal Q and equivalent to the above. So unification will take care of making this equivalent. Now a further generalization, what we do in Q and what we saw before is that instead of concrete values, we can also have types or constraints, but it goes further than that. Instead of having a single path, um, we can actually create uh, groups of paths by defining patterns of paths. So for this example, let's assume that we want to uh, require that each name field starts with a capital letter. So in this case, instead of repeating the constraint for each field, we can just match all fields within person that ends with name and insert a constraint. So for those of you familiar with aspect oriented programming, so the path pattern here is the point cut and the constraint is the advice. So let's see how Q solves these issues we identified earlier in practice. So Q provides a solution to the no complex computation dilemma. So it does so by supporting composable workflows in the Q tooling layer. So consider you have this configuration and then also a workflow with notes like declaratively specified that describe how to call some code defined elsewhere, not in Q, using a part of the configuration as input. Then the result of that computation is injected back into the configuration, making it more specific. So initially only nodes that have concrete values as input are run. But then as this process continues, more nodes will become, the inputs for no, more nodes will become concrete. And we then continue this until a fixed point is reached. So note that this heavily relies on the commutativity of graph unification, right, of the order independence. So jumping back to the spreadsheet analogy, this is really comparable to how in spreadsheets uh, you have code for functions that is kept separate, but can be referred to within the cells uh, for evaluation. So of course this means uh, the initial configuration is incomplete, but uh, logic programming languages are quite good at dealing with this, right? They can reason over incomplete data. So also with a clean separation, it's actually much easier to account to where values are coming from. So overall, this approach is clearly more cumbersome than having being able to do the computation directly in the DSL and having a DSL that supports computation. But we consider this to be a good compromise to still allow this possibility, we're at the same time strongly discouraging it, because in generally, uh, you do not want to do this computation in the configuration layer. So Q's composition also solves the abstraction dilemma. So of course, you do not need, may, you may not need abstraction if your goal is only safety, because Q constraints already take care of that. But if you still need abstractions to, for example, map to different backends or to simplify some interface, uh, you can still do so while still supporting the full API and without having drift or needing to support this full API in the abstraction itself. So basically what you do is within the abstraction, you can include an escape hatch section that maps directly to the underlying full API. So this can then be merged verbatim into the result of expanding the abstraction. And because of the nature of Q's composition, this will then still give the full protection full access to the API while still allowing abstractions. So the Q type system follows naturally from its lattice model and are expressed as constraints. So it's basically just as precise as you will have the assertions in, in GCL. They're just much easier to reason over. And also you get this really awesome two-in-one benefit of them being both generative and validating at the same time. So Q also has a solution for the issue with GCL that it cannot catch field typos. So this is a tricky one, as by default, API should be extendable. So you could argue that introducing a field is not necessarily an error. But take the analogy from pro protocol buffers. So suppose we have a protobuf definition that we compiled into C++. So if we refer to a field in code that does not exist, we get an error. On the other hand, if we unmarshal an incoming message that has an unknown field, this is ignored and it passes. 
So similarly, a queue program that refers to an unknown field in a queue definition results in an error. And also adding a field uh, to such definition results in an error. Um, but it's possible to extend such type using embedding, which is a trick we uh, took from Go. Um, there's also a proposed uh, cast operator that would mimic unmarshalling semantics. So another thing that Q solves is the ability to have cycles. So I personally find it quite annoying in GCL to not have the ability to do that. So look at this example. So here we, at the top example, we have a field A and B that we want to be equal to each, each other as a requirement. So we can do that by having field A referring to B and vice versa. Now, if it, in addition, we specify a field A to be uh, three, then both A and B will adopt this value three as we would expect. Now, a bit more complicated example is using expressions. So here we see again the field A and B, uh, which both have an expression to, to compute the value from each other. Right now, if we set a field A to three, you see that B is derived from A and it's computing. So this really gives template writers the freedom to generate or validate fields regardless of which field the user picks to fill out first. And this is also a good example of how constraints work as both validation and generation at the same time. It's not the only way, but it's a good example. Um, so for those of you familiar with it, note how this is strikingly similar to propagator networks and how propagator networks work. So Q essentially is a propagator network. So even though we did not know about this concept when developing Q, um, basically because they're both based on lattices, it's not so strange that they end up with very similar properties. So here's another example where uh, cycle handling in Q is quite crucial. So as Q operates on all levels of configuration, uh, it needs to support types of system with which we want to interface. So for example, on the left hand, we have a recursive definition of a list in Go. So we wanna be able to represent these kind of types in Q. So Q really needs to be able to, to also handle these cycles in this case. So this is what we see on the right hand side here. And um, to distinguish it from really truly infinite structures, we use the um, or null here, which is the equivalent to using the pointer in, in Go. So in conclusion, uh, large scale configurations as implemented with GCL resulted in a lot of issues. But in Q, we solved these issues. So Q is remarkably simple, yet it's still very powerful. It has no inheritance, has no complex computation, it doesn't allow it. Um, it has uh, validation, it's SRE friendly, and it allows for scalable engineering. And because of its simplicity, um, we think it's actually perfectly suitable for simple applications as well. So basically the idea is here that it can grow all the way from uh, zero till uh, nine o'clock, but then stop the complexity clock right there because it actually implements the requirements we set out to have for GCL and that we generally need for good configuration languages. So now because Q operates at so many levels, um, users have been using it for quite a wide variety of tasks. Some well-known users are Salesforce, Alibaba, Grafana Labs, and NTT Communications. So Q is also more than just the language. So as it, at its core, it's a logic programming engine. So the DSL is just one interface to this, but the API is another. So some testimonials so remember the language requirement diagram I showed earlier, where configurations were defined in the bottom right? So the feedback from SREs we've gotten is that indeed Q is positioned in this bottom right corner. So the compositional model uh, forces one to think more about structure. So this can make it harder to get going with, uh, with Q than compared to, for example, GCL. Um, but the result is actually much easier to read, debug, and maintain and it's a big win overall. So compare this with GCL, uh, where inheritance really gives it more of the property of a scripting language, where it's very easy to get going and modify things, but where it makes it really hard to read and maintain. So, so some software engineers have noted that once you get used to the equivalence of types and values, it's really hard to get back. So for instance, not only can you define policy, you can also define constraints on policies or basically a policy type. So you really, you can apply these constrictions and 
and types of every level wherever you want it. So we're currently at a pre 1.0 uh, level, which basically means we're working towards uh, giving a backwards compatibility uh, guarantee. Uh, we're also working to setting up a foundation where we can, uh, you know, nicely house queue and we're uh, identifying some strong partners to help staff up, um, you know, development around Q. So I thank you very much for listening. Uh, it might have been a lot to take in. There were a lot of new concepts, but if you have any questions, feel free to ping me on any of these channels uh, listed here.